Hello, hello, can everyone hear me? All right, well, I hope everyone can hear me. I, okay, cool. Hello everyone, it is so nice to see people in the chat already. Good morning, good evening, it's morning for me, might be evening for you. And thank you for showing up to today's panel about romancing the past, Japan's Rekijo and their samurai love. It's nice to see familiar faces in the chat and to everyone that I don't know and didn't believe to watching my stream, uh, thank you for coming. And I can't wait to tell you all about Rekijo and how cool they are. So my name is Carp, also known as Carpfish, and I am your lovely host for today. And I hope you're all having a fantastic FujoCon so far. Um, there have been some really cool panels, some really cool artists in the artist alley, and this is just a really cool con format. So thank you for having me. And I am very excited to be here, as you can probably tell from how fast I'm talking. So we don't have too much time and there is lots I want to cover. So let us, let us start. Some of us, some of you may have read the summary of this panel on Twitter or on the FujoCon site already, but for those who have just wandered in, let me explain real quick. This panel is all about the Japanese Rekijo subculture, or as I like to put it, a fun informal lecture on why dead men with swords are cool and why the girls who love them are even cooler. So this panel is going to be some history lesson, it's going to be some lit review, it's going to have some case studies and, and things like that about things that Rekijo do and things that they do to make an impact in Japan. And at the end, there's going to be some Q&A and discussion. I'll share some overthinking thoughts. You can tell me what you think about them. For the record, I'm not an academic or a pro. I'm just a very nerdy fan who reads papers in their spare time. So if anyone has any amendments or things that they know more about that they would like to add on at the end, please do so. I'd love to hear about them. So just as a quick note, there are brief, brief mentions of suicide because of how history goes. And I'm just recounting how history happens. And I'm not going to go into detail about any of it, but just putting it out there so no one is caught off guard. Also, a lot of my information is from papers by a researcher called Akiko Sugawa Shimada, whose, whose papers are actually really fun to read. And I will be posting my sources on Twitter after the panel if you're interested and you like reading these things like I do. So without further ado, let us begin. So Nekijo might be a completely new word to you, or you may have heard it before, because there has been some English language coverage of this, most prominently in NPR, as you can see in the corner there. You might read some headlines every now and then on like Anime News Network or on Sora News and things like that, saying things like, load up on swords, bring your girlfriends, or Japanese history geek girls snapping up copies of megular, mega popular book about Japanese swords and wonder, huh, so what's that about? Well, let me tell you about what they're about. They're actually all about Rekijo. I've been saying this word a lot, but let's actually break down and define what it means. The term Rekijo is made up of two different words in Japanese, Rekishi, which is history, and Joshi, which is women or girls. So when you take the Reki from Rekishi and the Jo from Joshi, it forms the word Rekijo, which roughly means history girl. And that's the name of the subculture that we're going to be talking about today. So now that you know where the word comes from, what exactly is a Rekijo? A Rekijo is a female fan of Japanese history, usually pre-modern, so that means samurai. It, they're often introduced to history via popular media, so video, sorry, video games, anime, manga, light novels, things like that, rather than, you know, normal middle school history lessons. They often have strong attachments to specific individuals or groups as well, rather than being a general, oh, I love history, all of it, or I love, or or I love the World War II period. They'll have an attachment to a specific person or group of figures. For example, I love the Sengoku warlord Oda Nobunaga, and others might be huge fans of this certain group of warriors in the Bakumatsu period called the Shinsengumi. We'll be talking about that later. They also are described to have an idol-like relationship with historical figures in that the way they treat a historical figure isn't so much like, oh, this is the founder of our country and I want to respect them, or I want to learn how to run business the way that so-and-so general did their battle tactics. It's more like 
they, the historical figure themselves is your idol. You stand them. This means that there's a lot of effective response. That means emotional kind of like um, emotional response, like how when you see your favorite anime character or a or a K-pop or J-pop idol, you see them and it's like, oh my god, I love you. It's not like, oh my god, I feel feel res respect for what you have done for our country. Though there's obviously there obviously might be an element of that. It's like, oh my God, it's my favorite historical boy. I love you. So that's a bit of a different fan response than some other history types of history fans may have. And another thing about Rekijo is that they generally seek psychological connections that can, that's kankese and relationships with these historical figures. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. So a brief history of history girls is that the word rekijo actually is coined from the term rekidoru, which is rekishi idolu, history idols. These are idol pop stars and models who were fans of history, and that kind of became like one of their one of their known traits, their gimmicks. It's, it's like there, this includes women like Kohinata Eri, who is a former seiyu and actress, and now is a pop history writer and a tourism ambassador to Sekigahara which is really cool. And Anne Watanabe on the right, who is also an actress, a seiyu, and a model for big brands like Chanel. And she actually voiced the titular character from the movie Miss Hawkside, which is really cool. So these are, these are kind of like celebrities who are known for being really into history and they just kind of gained a reputation for it. But before Reki Jo came along, history was considered a mostly male hobby, primarily an old man's hobby. Not many young people were interested in it. However, Rekijo gained popular media attention in 2009, mainly due to the influence of three media and media franchises. Those three are Sengok Basara, Hakuoki, and Gintama. So Sengok Basara, as you can see here, our, fir our first one on the left is uh, is a series that started as a video game and had its anime debut in 2009, so perfect timing. You might be able to tell from the poster, but it has very flashy designs and portrays Sengoku era warlords as attractive, young, cool men. And it's a series known for a lot of its stylistic flair and just kind of like an absurd humor to it. You, I'm not sure how clearly you can see this, but Date Masamune in the blue is holding three swords in one hand, and Ieyasu Tokugawa in the yellow, his fist is literally on fire. There's also a, a bunch of other weird stuff that goes on, like for example, for example, Masamune is so cool that his horse has literal motorcycle exhaust pipes. And there's another character who's so huge that he stands on two horses and runs vertically up castle walls to see him. So it's a pretty wild series and that kind of fun, zany atmosphere, as well as the visual flair of the designs, makes made it really popular and get, garnered a lot of popularity for the historical figures featured in it. Another series that that uh, instigated the 2009 Rekijo Rek Rek boom is the visual novel Hakuoki, an otome game by Idea Factory. And it features, it features you, the player, in the role of a young female protagonist who gets to live and work with and romance these members of the Shinsengumi while, unsolv while solving a mystery about kind of a larger war going on as well as trying to track down your father. It's a very popular intellectual property. It's become manga, anime, everything like that as well. And it is to this date still one of Idea Factory's best-selling series and they just milk it for all it's worth. PS2 release was in 2008. Since then it has been ported into onto almost every console under the sun. Hakuoki's great. Hakuoki had a big influence on how much people love the Shinsengumi today. And thirdly, there is Gintama, which is a funny, popular gag, sorry, gag manga and anime that has the Shinsengumi as popular, handsome young men who are who are recurring characters in the show. They're not the main characters, but they recur pretty often. And as you can see, they look pretty dashing in that all black uniform. So they garnered a lot of popularity as well for the historical figures they were based off of. 
So on the backs of these three series, as well as other works that had more and more historical figures in them or were based off them, Jackie Joe really gained some media attention, gained, gained the eye of the media, and you can actually see the term printed in the Asahi Shimbun newspaper in 2009, and it became one of the phrases of the year. So it was a pretty big deal. So now you've heard me talk a lot about what Sen the Sengoku period or the Shinzangumi or Data Masamune and things like that. And if you're kind of new to the, if you're kind of new to Japanese history, then you might not really know what I'm talking about. So let me just go through a really quick, let me just go, um, go through a really quick intro of what these periods that, sorry, Rekijo tend to really like and just introduce them to you a bit. So firstly, there's the Sengoku period, which, which was a period of constant upheaval and civil war from the 14, six, from 1467 to 1615. Essentially what happened is after the Ashikaga shogunate collapse and the emperor had no real power in Japan, there was a power vacuum and all the individual territories, feudal lords had a, a free for all. It was dog eat dog, just every single lord of every five trying to establish their own territory, expand their territory, take over their neighbors, lots of fighting, lots of battles, lots of different samurai with duking it out with their own agendas and their personalities. There's tons of stories that come from this period. There's rivalries, alliances, betrayal, romance, you've got it all. It was a very colorful and very chaotic period of time and it is possibly the biggest focal point of Rekijo attentions just because of how much stuff and how many figures there are to be interested in that time. For example, I've already mentioned Date Masamune, who was the lord of what is now Sendai, and what was now Sendai, and he was known to be so flashy and so stylish that flashy guys to this day in contemporary Japan are still called Date Men to this very day. Next, the Shinsengumi, as featured in Hakuoki, they were active much later than the Sengoku period. They were they were a order of kind of samurai. Ish, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, and they were established from 1863 to 18 and until they were disbanded at well, until 1867. And this was during the Bakumatsu period when the Tokugawa shogunate, which had been in power for about 200 years at that point, was collapsing. And to put it simply, not too flatteringly, they were essentially a hit squad on anti shogunate dissidents. But these days, that doesn't sound very. That doesn't very sound very nice or romantic, and they're more popularly characterized as like underdog last defenders of the shogunate. Because late in the later years of the, Shin, of the Shinsengu, uh, when the shogunate was collapsing, uh, during the Boshin Civil War that was going on then, when anti-shogunate forces actually moved in on the capital to depose the shogunate and instill the emperor as the seat of power again, what happened was the Shinsengumi were some of the very last defenders of the shogunate order from some of the people who fought for the shogunate until the very end, even when even the shogunate itself had given up. So they get a lot of popularity for that kind of underdog spirit there. And they're known for charismatic leaders like Hijikata Toshizo on the left in the purple, who was known as the demon vice captain and also lots of tragic young men like Okita Soji on the right, who was a sword, who was a swordplay genius who died young of TB. Another popular historical figure is Sakamoto Ryoma, who is one of, if not the most popular Japanese historical figure of basically all time. He was also active in the Bakumatsu period and he is considered one of the fathers of the Meiji Restoration that came later. He was a visionary, grew up in a small coastal town in, called Tosa, and he struck out to become one of the greatest revolutionaries of the Meiji Restoration. He brokered alliances between revolutionary groups, he wrote early policy, he established the first trading company in Japan, which at that point had been locked, basically locked out of like international trade for 200 years by the shogunate. He did a lot of stuff, and his legacy is not as violent as some other of the ref re revolutionaries during this period. So he has a really good rep. Um, also, another appealing thing is that by all accounts, he was really into his wife. He was really into his wife, this lady called Oryo. And what happened was how they met 
because he was in an inn. He was staying at an inn where she was working and someone was trying to assassinate him. And she heard that while she was in the bath. So she ran out naked to warn him. And after that, you got to marry her, right? They are accredited as having Japan's first honeymoon, which is very romantic. And Sakamoto Ryoma is just a very, very popular figure in Japanese history. Unfortunately, he was successfully assassinated in 1867, so he never got to see the revolution that he worked for. And finally, this last figure is slightly less common, is slightly less common of a Dekijo, like, focus of affection. However, I have a ton of friends who love him, so I feel like I would be doing them a disservice if I didn't talk about them. So, buddies, this is for you. Okay, so this is Minamoto no Yoshitsune, who was active a long, long time before any of these other guys. He, he dates back to the 12th century and was a hero of the Genpei Civil War, Genpei Civil War between the Minamoto and Taira, Taira clans. He was a great commander and he won impossible victories for the Minamoto. And he's also known for having a band of motley retainers. For example, the wild mountain monk Benkei, who stayed with him until the very end. But the thing is, Yoshitsune was so good at war that after the war ended, his brother Yoritomo became the shogun and got really paranoid over how much the people loved Yoshitsune, how popular he was and how strong he was. So he betrayed Yoshitsune and started hunting him down as an enemy of the shogun. This eventually forced Yoshitsune to be cornered and he had to commit seppuku. But he still memorialized, memorialized in theater, art, literature as one of the biggest heroes in Japanese history. So now that we know exactly what kinds of figures, what kinds of time periods Yokijo like, one might question, so why do I, they like it? I mean, it seems cool, but why, the, why specifically dead Japanese guys anyways? What is the appeal? So firstly, historical fiction and being really into into reinventing and retelling the stories of their historical figures has always been a huge thing in Japan. It goes all the way back to 14th century no theater where they would act out and retell important literary or historical events. This isn't new in other countries as well. Shakespeare with Richard III, for example. And actually there's an issue where during the Edo period, a lot of kabuki, a lot of kabuki theater playwrights got around government censorship by by making metaphors that was like, oh, well, we're not we're not criticizing this government. We're criticizing this government that was a couple hundred years ago. So we're talking about that stuff that was in the past. So there's a lot and lot and lot of historical plays from the Edo era. And it's actually been an issue that so many of these kabuki plays made up so much made, made up so much embellishments and stories about historical figures that got us so accepted into the popular canon that it's actually kind of hard to for historians now to parse out what was real and what was just from a kabuki play that everyone accepted. Okay, this is real now. But another, but obviously another reason why Becky Joe like all these historical properties is because they have a lot of attractive young men, very compelling emotional dramas. Like as we just mentioned, there's death, there's betrayal, there's romance, lots of really cool, lots of really cool stuff going on and what's not to like. It also helps that a lot of these intellectual properties have very many types of guys. Like there's the older brother type, there's the kind of like cold tsundere type, there's the calculating one, there's there's the wild one. There's just lots of different types. There's something for everyone. If you don't like this art type, you can find another one easily. It also helps that there are few female characters. There's few women in these in these stories, either because of the historical marginalization of women, it, they didn't get to go out much and things like that, or because of the format of the genre. Like, for example, Hakuoki the Ultimate Game doesn't have very many women characters, aside from the, aside from the uh, main protagonist and supporting characters. So this actually allows the audience a lot of open space, imagine relationships between characters and characters for shipping, of course, we're at Fujicom, what else? But also to imagine relationships between the character and self. So unless you're really into Sakamoto Ryoma um, and he's like 
really into his wife, you can just be like, oh yeah, well, sure, Dr. Masamune had a wife, but she's not in this series, so I can just imagine that she's me, you know? It also helps that samurai are just cool. Gekijo are hardly the only Japanese who think samurais are cool, and Japan is hardly the only country who think samurai are cool. Samurai are just a huge part of Japanese history with lots of lore, lots of drama related to it, so it's it makes sense why people would be attracted to that. It also it's also that samurai are slightly distant from are, are pretty distant from the ongoings of everyday right now. They're from like a bygone era and they're a part of the past. So they're it they might be seen as a bit more apolitical. Like it's far less of a, a statement and far less it, it makes much less of a statement about like your current political interests or things like that to say, oh yeah, I love my favorite historical figure is this like old dead guy who fought, who fought with some swords a couple centuries ago compared to yeah, this politician from like 30 years ago whose policies affect us even now. So it's just, there's this perception of samurai being like much more apolitical and there's not necessarily so much baggage along with it because it was just so long ago. You also might have noticed that from before when I was telling the stories, there was, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on people who died before they could do what they wanted to do or died very tragically or were losers in wars or personal struggles and things like that. Historical losers are especially appealing to Rekijo. There's a theory that this has to do with the female fans maternal instincts that they see this historical figure who's gone through so many struggles and it's like, oh, my baby, I want to protect you, which is like, ah. but I can see, I can see the argument that like seeing a character or a figure who has gone through a lot of struggles at least prompts some sympathy and empathy from the audience, regardless of gender. But also, Ivan Morris, a very acclaimed uh, Japanese studies scholar, has a book called The Nobility of Failure, where he talks about Japan's fascination with historical figures whose battles end in failure. His theory is that the loss, his argument is that the loss only makes their ideals and their will even more poignant. And the fact that some of these figures go into the battles knowing the, the futility of their struggle that they're going to lose, it only makes their dedication and their loyalty even more admirable. It's like how the true fans of a sports team are the ones that don't give up on it, even when they're down 10, 10 to zero at the end of the game, you know? And the fact that a lot of these historical figures that their efforts never came to fruition or they died before they could see their ambitions realized really incites our interest because TLDR, who doesn't love angst? So congrats, you're a Rekijo and you're really into this historical figure. Say you're the Rekijo, who is Japanese living in Japan. The good news is that, wow, these guys that you were really into, they're dead, but they were also Japanese living in Japan and you conveniently live in the same country as them. So you can actually go travel and see the places they used to live, they used to go around, the things that they did their life at. That was very good English. So this is called content tourism. Welcome to the world of content tourism, a huge cornerstone in Japan's tour in Japan's economic strategy and tourism plan and just the cool Japan strategy in general. Content tourism is basically when you go somewhere as a tourist, not just for what's inherently at the place, like not just for the castle or the museum or the scenery, but because of content, usually media content that is associated with that place. For example, Rekijo going to the castles where their favorite samurai lived. And content tourism goes as far back as 17th century during the Edo period when poet Matsuo Basho's travel haikus were so dope that fans would travel to the places he wrote poetry about to see for themselves. And women's travel, women's travel in Japan actually wasn't that big of a thing before the 1970s. Solo women travelers were seen as trouble, but after a boom in a boom in fashion magazines like Anan and Nonno promoting an image of solo female travelers. There was a there was an increase in solo female travelers, which is a lot of what Nekijo are. They're just women going to these places that they want to see by themselves. <clears throat> Sorry, I need to clear my throat. Another big another big instigator 
of content terrorism based on historical proxies and Reki Joe tourism before Reki Joe were even a thing is tiger dramas. Since the 1980s, tiger dramas, which are large scale, high budget TV dramas that air at primetime slots, they're year long character focused historical stories that are usually focused on a single figure. They have been casting handsome actors, musicians as leads for a long time since the 1980s, and that really captured the female market. Also, the fact that their shows run for so long and like get so much exposure really increases your chances of like doing good things for the tourism market for wherever for whatever sites are associated with the figure that they're featuring. In fact, there's five minute segments at the end of each episode advertising places to do with these figures' lives and how to get there via public transport. So it's commonly accepted that Taiga dramas will bring a tourism boom, boom to wherever is related to the historical figure. You can see some posters. There's Roma Den about Roma. There's Yoshitsune about Yoshitsune. Pretty self-explanatory. And there's also Gat as Usagi Kenshin in in um, in the Taiga drama about his about his rival Takeda, Takeda Shingen. So you can see they get some pretty pretty faces in these Taiga dramas, and the impact on tourism is to the point where. In 2010, when Ryoma then came out, the Bank of Japan estimates that 56.5 billion yen gains were made to the Kochi city because of Ryoma then. 56.5 billion yen. Another huge, another huge precursor of Nekijo contents tourism is a light novel called Mirage of Blaze, which ran from 1990 to 2004 by the author Mizuna Kuwabara. And this later turns into manga, anime, OVA, very mixed media, very, very big. And it features Takeya Ogi and Nobutsu Naoe, who are these two, two men. Takeya Ogi is a high schooler, and Nobutsu Naoe is, he's approached by an older man, Nobutsu Naoe, who tells Takeya that he's the reincarnation of Sengoku warrior, Uoseki Kagetora, which, give, which gives him special powers, and together they use their powers to exercise evil spheres, just to reduce the plot, very simply. During all this, there's a loss of development of their very complicated relationship, and Takeya starts regaining memories of his past life. It's all very fraught and tragic. But this series' popularity with women led to a huge spike in female interest about Uoseki Kagetora, as well as the Uoseki clan and fans flocked to historical sites and, and reenactments to do with him. In fact, they were so they were so much of a thing that there was a phrase for Mirage of Blaze tours, tourists, which was Mirage. So at first when I was reading this, I, I'll admit, I did not know too much about the series before researching for this panel. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Huh, I wonder what the series is about. And then I saw the cover art for some of it, and it, it explains a lot. It, it explains a lot. I mean, it's not technically a BL, I don't think, but look at this. We all know, we, we all know what's going on. So a lot of fans, a lot of fans of Mirage, and a lot of fans even now, what they do when they travel for content tourism, when they travel to the sites, that they're interested in is they're looking for kankese, which is relationships and connection. That psychological connection that I talked about earlier, and that's kind of what sets that's kind of what sets Dekijo tourism apart from other kinds of heritage or content tourism compared to say just an otaku going to to the city where Lucky Star where Lucky Star is based off of. So Suga Shimada posits that this the way this kankese works is that Rekijo, when they visit, are not just looking for narrative qualities, like this is where that event happened, but also looking for a connection or relationship with what happened there. So there's kind of multi-layered historical, there's kind of multi-layered relationships between the characters and self and the characters and self and historical figures. For example, Rekijo, or say Mirage Nu that went to see the Uesagi castle, for example, would often say, oh, I'm going to go see Takaya Naoe. So they're establishing a connection between themselves and the fictional characters. And they're also visiting this because they're interested in the ship of Takaya Naoe. So, there's, it's the, so they're strengthening a relationship between the two characters as well by doing this. 
But also a third relationship that's going on is that they are trying to, through the character, establish a relationship between themselves and the historical figure. So, so in that sense, it's kind of saying, okay, I go to the Uesegi castle because of Mirage of Blaze, and I see all the stuff about Uesegi Kagetora, and because I feel like I know Kagetora through the series, it establishes a relationship between this old samurai, this, this historical figure, and me, and I feel like I know the figure personally, or they at least have a special significance to me. So there's a lot of relationship seeking in all of this, and I think that's really cool. This can also be seen for non-Mirage historical fandoms and Rekijo, of course, for example, there is this note left at Mibu Shrine, which reads, Okita Soji, I love you. Don't lose the tuberculosis. I love how Okita-san is a great swordsman and how he's kind of sickly and that he, how he's a bit too nether. Please kill me. Love, Yui. You go, Yui. Live your best life. So you can see that kind of relationship seeking in the way that Yui talks to Okita Soji as if he's still alive, firstly. And secondly, how she like establishes how a familiarity with Okita Soji as not only a character, but also a historical figure through this love letter. This was left in the Mibu Shrine's messenger book, and there's lots of other messages like it, and I think that's really cute, you know? Rekijo also have a big positive impact on local tourism, and this can be easily seen through two case studies of Ishida town in Shiga prefecture, and the way that the, the historical figure Chosukabe Motochika has been revived in the Koshi prefecture. So, to, to introduce Ishida Town a bit, oops. To introduce Ishida Town a bit, um, Ishida Mitsunari is kind of seen as the villain of the Sengoku era, in that at the end, during the climactic battle of Sekigahara, it was between Ieyasu Tokugawa and Ishida Mitsunari, leading the, e the Eastern and the Western armies, and Tokugawa won. So Mitsunari, Ishida Mitsunari, immediately becomes a bad guy, it's vilified, it's, it's, is, is talked of as evil and everyone hates him and the Tokugawa execute him and rule Japan for the next 200 years. So he was not a very popular character for a, a not, not very popular historical figure for a long time because of this bad rep but after Sengoku Basara portrays him as a loyal tortured soul who is a loyal puppy to Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and after he was featured in two taiga dramas with very handsome actors, Ishida Town, which is the birthplace of Mitsunari, um, it has a memorial that used to only receive two to three visitors a month, usually middle-aged men. But in 2009, after all this happened, annual visitors to Ishida Town exceeded 1,000, approximately 90% of whom were women. And they were obviously here because of the Reki Show boom. This is also the case for the figure Chosokabe Motochika, who was a Sengoku warlord who, who was very active in the Shikoku area of Japan and was virtually unknown before Basara when he became a sexy pirate bro. Afterwards, the Chosokabe Motochika fan club was established in Motoyama town in January 2009. The Kochi Prefectural Museum of History in Nagoku City set up regular exhibits about Chosokabe that April. You can see immediately the effects that Rekijo and their interest in this figure have on the surrounding heritage and historical preservation landscape. In fact, it, in, in Kochi, there's the Wakamiya Hachimangu Shrine, which has this which has a statue of him. Uh, this is this was the one. This is the one at the museum. I don't think it, it's this statue we're talking about. But the statue saw a drastic rise in visitors, and in the and in the message books, there would be lots of messages like "You are shining, Aniki." Aniki is what they call him in Basara, and you're the coolest in Japan. So you can immediately see how his popularity skyrocketed thanks to Basara. It's also worth mentioning that oh, yeah, it's also worth mentioning that these characters appear in Sengoku Muso, that um, Samurai Warriors as well. Samurai Warriors, I have not seen as many sources that cite it as a huge impact, but I do know there are lots of people who like the series and got into history because of this series, so I want to acknowledge their existence as well. Ishida, Ishida Mitsunari Sen, Sengoku Muso's hat is very fluffy. 
So now you may be thinking, okay, so this is kind of cool, but all this data is kind of old, 2009, 2010. These are all like a decade ago. What's going on now? Are histories, are history girls a thing of the past? And the answer is no, because this is where I really go off. And this is where I throw my notes out the window because I can recite this all from heart essentially. So let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about a company that I'm sure FujoCon attendees know quite well called Nitro Plus, called Nitro Plus, which is the main company of another, which is the main company that has a branch called Nitro Plus Kira, which makes some games that if you are too young to recognize who is whose face is censored behind there, you really should not look these games up. But anyways, Nitro Plus and DMM.com, which is a, which is an it, an online platform for lots of things, including games, decided that they wanted to that they wanted to jump in on two different trends. One is the Becky Jo trend, and the other is the trend of browser games like Kantai Collection, where you have very where you have collection games that have personifications of inanimate objects. And they chose Japanese swords because Japanese swords have cool samurai associations. There's lots of history and lore. Girl, Rebecca Joe love history and lore, and they can make them into hot guys. This is Tokenabu. The story is this: the year is 2205. You are a you are a sage, a Saniwa sage, and there is a weird monster army wrecking history and trying to change the past. So the time government, which you work for apparently, decides that the best way to combat this is to take historical Japanese swords and have you summon the, tsuku, the tsukumogami, the kind of like souls of these objects, into physical form, into these token danshi sword boys, to fight, to protect history. You have to Rekishi Mamoru. And this is the premise of the token Rambu game that has basically swept all, all of the, like, the entire Rekijo scene that exists today. Like, I could go on for about this for hours, and I literally have. If any of you have been to Anime Boston, I have run panels on Tokenambu for like four years there now. But to put sim things simply, Tokenambu, this, sim this simple premise caught on like a straw house in a magma field. And let me, let me just describe to you how big this has gotten since 2015. Since 2015, Token Ambu has been ported to mobile as well as has a Chinese version now. There are two different animes with three seasons between them and one movie from Ufotable that we'll probably never see. There are two unique 2.5D theater franchises. Yes, there's two franchises, not like two stage plays, two franchises, musical and stage play. And there's seven unique musicals. If including four group labs and four individual tours, not including reruns. There's nine different stage plays. And recently, because it's the fifth anniversary of 2.5D franchises, they're having a huge crossover event, event of 72. Yes, you heard me, 72 actors on stage at once. I have no clue how that's going to happen. There's a live action movie. There is more merch and I have tears to cry. Token Rambu, it sounds reductive to say that all of Becky Joe fandom is Token Rambu right now, but it's also just impossible to deny that just from its sheer popularity and cultural impact, Token Rambu is positively the face of Becky Joe right now. Let me show you how big this is. Oh, also, since we are at FujiCon, I also want to mention that a big a big common point between Jekijo and Fujo is, is obviously that there's lots of overlap. A lot of the franchises that people get into Jekijo from are the same are the same ones that they are also Fujoshi for. Here is a spread of beautiful art that I have recruited from my beautiful friends, and just to show not only the Jekijo potential but also the lovely BL potential of all these series. So let me thank you all individually. Credits from from top left, thank you to Berg, thank you for Tofu, uh, Nihongo's tits are fabulous, I owe you my life. Thank you Mavs for this Basara art, thank you to Shen for Ieyasu's abs, and a special shout out to, in the bottom left corner, to, Iv and Ed, to Ivy and Egg, who made a straight up parody BL 
like mini visual novel of Tolkien and Rambu for April Fool's one year. So there's lots and lots and lots of fan engagement with not only the history side, but also the BL side of these franchises. And I just think that's beautiful. I also think my friend's art is beautiful. This is me showing. So how big is Tolkien and Rambu? It has fans lining up un in mass at museums in the rain to see exhibits of their favorite swords. It has had a musical at a UNESCO World Heritage Site, an idol live performance at a UNESCO Heritage Site, Itsukushiba Shrines. There was also a stage play show, a one-time show at Odawara Castle because the other stage play branches couldn't let itself be one up by this Itsukushima show. And the Tokyo Rambu has even been on live national television with the Backstreet Boys. That Those are the Backstreet Boys circled in Red Bear. It's really huge. And one might think, okay, well, that's cool, but how much does this actually have to do with history? Isn't it just pretty boys? But history and Tokyo Rambu are so deeply intertwined, and the fans are really into the history of the swords because that's where all the content is. The game itself actually doesn't give us much characterization and content. It's very bare bones. A lot of the plot is built up through, has only been built, built up in recent years or through spin-off works like the anime and stage plays. So before that, and even now, a lot of content comes from your own historical research and historical application and interpretation of the characters. For example, this is Uzi Izumi no Kami Kanesada, who is Hijikata Toshizo's sword, and you can see on his back, actually it's a bit hard to see, but he wears the signature blue and white haori of the Shinsengumi on his chest. That phoenix emblem is one of Hijikata's, is part of Hijikata's crest. It's just a lot to do with his historical master. And this is also emphasized in the game where the swords interact and have conversations sometimes talking about, oh, this historical event happened. We were both there or we both shared the same master and sharing their feelings and their thoughts and their reactions. There's actually a very interesting treatment of history in Token Rambu where, where there will often be different swords that own, were owned by a master and their relationships to that master can be dramatically different. One, for example, in Oda Nobunaga's case, sometimes the stories that he owned will be like, oh, he was a demon, he was horrible, he was a monster, I hate him. And others will be like, no, he, he was my master, I love him. And others will be like, well, he killed a lot of people, but uh, that was pretty normal, I guess. Oh, well. So there's a, a lot of the characterization and the conversation that goes on in Token Rambu is based on, on this bedrock foundation of the history that goes behind it. In addition, I mentioned that a lot of the plot that happens has is in this spin-off works, and historical figures live really large in this in these spin-off works. Here you can see pictures of stage play actors. That is Nanami Hiroki from a former Takarazuka actress who is going to be playing Gracia in an upcoming play. There's Fujita Rei, who is gorgeous and plays Enomoto Takeaki, and there's o in the musical, and at the bottom there's Okita Soji as he appears in the Hanamaru anime. So these, so these um, historical figures are not just mentioned in Tokenambu, they often appear as actual characters themselves. And while at first they may seem to be supporting characters, they're constantly talked about, they're, con they're constantly involved, especially in the stage plays. They're full-fledged characters in their own right, and they even get their own singles to sing and dance to. It's really central. And the incorporation of history into Tolkien Rambu fandom is so close that it's so closely entwined that whenever there's a new sword preview released, like they'll show just a short, a tiny glimpse of the new sword design, immediately there will be Twitter threads all over of people speculating, oh, it's this sword because this, 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 it's this sword because of that, 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 that. Like it's going to be, it goes completely Pepe Silva all across the history nerds forums over how, over trying to like speculate which sword and which historical figures are associated to it. So that is really awesome, I think. In addition, Token Rambu fandom has a huge impact on historical preservation, the museum scene all over Japan. It is not an exaggeration to say that Token Rambu has absolutely galvanized the Japanese museum scene because of how popular content tourism it is in this fandom. 
good thing about Tokyo Nambu is when your boys are swords, they are they are for the most part, I will not say all the time, are actual swords that exist and sometimes you can even go see them in museums. You can see your IRL husband though in blood and steel form right before your eyes. That's basically as that's basically as good as it gets. So the huge museum presence of Tokenambu is such that even the Kyoto National Muse Museum has had huge collaborations with Tokenambu where, where they feature swords and especially advertise that they have all these swords that appear in Tokenambu and they have like life-size cardboard cutouts of the characters in the lobby. They have collaboration goods. There's also instances where there are collaboration goods in, with the museum, like with this folder of Gokutai in, in the white down, down at the bottom of this slide, where people who line up for people who line up for the museum exhibit, the first 200 people or so a day, will get these special folders. People line up for hours before the museum opens. There's also huge, there's also huge like local tourism promotion efforts, like the rapid Shukuda Kiri meets Tada train, where they took a token Rambu character and made an entire express train to like his, to like his museum. And this is a JR collaboration. They just plastered him all over the train and used it to boost tourism to Mito. It's really wild. In addition, Token Rambu really boosts not only the museums and the local tourism, but also like traditional crafts. That's sword, swordsmiths. Swords, as you might expect, are not hugely in are not hugely in demand now. So swordsmiths sometimes have a hard time getting work, but Token Rambu has actually done a lot to support this, not only because if you're a really rich Token Rambu fan, you can dream of buying a sword yourself. But because Token Rambu sometimes does things like commission swordsmiths and buy swords to have their creepy mascot engraved on it. And Token Rambu fans have also been notorious for just completely blowing up sword restoration and sword repair Kickstarters online. For example, on the bottom here, you see the sword restoration project of the Kunozan Toshogu uh, Mausoleum. And what happened was they found a bunch of this, a bunch of old swords in their in their basement that they didn't have the funds to repair and restore. So they hit up one of, one of Token Rambu's artists, Shiro Miwa, and was like, "Hey, we want to do a Kickstarter campaign to get people to give us money to restore these swords. We know that one of the swords that you drew is at." is with us in our museum. So could you, would you mind doing some like collaborating with us to do some special promo illustrations? And Shiro Miwa did it. Shiro Miwa did some great promo illustrations and these Kickstarters blow up like you wouldn't believe. You see that, you can see if you look closely that most of these are funded like 300, 400, 500%. The financial power of Token Nambu to like, suggest like, throw money at historical preservation is really, really, really cool. <clears throat> We're almost running out of time, so I'm going to go a bit faster here, sorry, but another but another huge example of how Tokenambu has benefited his historical preservation in Japan is the story of Shokudai Kiri Mitsutada. Shokudai Mitsutada Shokuda Kiri Mitsuta is a fashionable guy in black that you see here down on the bottom corner. He is a character in Tokenamu who got really popular after the game came out, but his sword was lost and thought to be destroyed in the Great Kanto earthquake hundreds of years ago. So everyone was like, uh, it's too bad his like IRL like sword is dead, basically. But a couple months after Tokenambu came out and after this, his character received great acclaim, the Tokugawa the Tokugawa Art Museum in Mito was like, hey, so um, we actually we actually looked for this sword and it's just been chilling in our basement this whole time. I mean, it's pretty damaged, so we, we didn't want to bring it out before, but hey, if you guys like it so much, we'll bring it out. And we're like, they did. They put it on national tour. They funded to get, they funded to get it a, a replica made. So now the original damage and the new repaired replica of the Shokuda Kiri Mitsutada are displayed together in the Mito, in the Mito Tokugawa Art Museum. He has a step, he has a 
cardboard cut out there, a whole little mini display, and even the museum blog has a tiny little Nendoroid of him that they use to give seasonal updates on how the museum's doing. It's really cute. In addition, he makes money for Mito, for Mito City by essentially, long story short, people can pay exorbitant amounts of money to in, in the form of like taxes to Mito City in order to get the chance to touch the Shokudai Kiri meets Tabe. This guy makes so much money for his home city. And, that, and this sword boom has not only affected museums and Rekijo and Token Rambu specifically, but just like increased the popularity of Japanese swords in society a lot as well. You can see here that there's there's people practicing sword, like kind of like sword techniques and things like that. Like Token Rambu fans and Rekijo and just women in general have gained a lot more interest in learning how to use Japanese swords and thinking that they're a cool thing. There's a lot more books and there's a lot more books and anthologies and stuff about Japanese swords that come out and they sell really well because of this. And on the right, there's even a pose collection of, there's a, a, even a BL pose collection of Boys of Swords for all of those historical sword wielding BL dr manga drawing purposes. So that's kind of where we're going to leave off for now. And let me just leave you with a couple overthinking thoughts about Tokunamu, about Rekijo, about this entire enterprise of historical moe confiction to think about as you lie awake at night, like I do. So now that we know all this stuff about Rekijo, what does that mean for our future preservation and memory of history? How does our perception, how does this fan perception of how does this fan perception of historical figures and our emotional attachment to them affect what is written about them, what is preserved for the future, for future generations to know? How does this affect the information that we keep and record? Like, just like with the Edo period Kabuki place. And what does it mean for heritage tourism and historical sites and preservation and museums that it's so tied to that it's so tied to money making? Not that it hasn't been before, but even now more so, that people are emotionally invested, not just in the museum, but also like the historical figures that it has to do. How does that affect how the museums present these figures and what they say about them and what they and what they do? Does that mean they does that mean they don't want to say bad things about like a certain historical figure because the fans might get mad? And is it, this Rekijo movement, it essentially does go back to a lot of visiting and worshiping at shrines and temples that <clears throat> that historical figures are enshrined in, and it has very, oh, this is this is Japanese, I am Japanese, I am Japanese, I'm rediscovering Japan through this kind of sentiment in it. So is that pop nationalist, is that pop spiritualist? What does that say about like soci society and like po politics at large? And can Nekijo be applied to other countries and their histories? Like, if we take the basic precepts of Nekijo being that you have a kind of a emotion, an emotional connection to these fictional characters, an idol-like emotional emotional connection. Can that be applied? Is that is that present in other countries as well? And what is it inherently female about Reki Jo? The Jo part of it uh, inherently implies that there's that it's female, but is this really a female mode of enjoying history? Like what? How, how will this terminology will evolve in the future? It's just lots of things I think about. And finally, before we cut to the Q&A, which we have five minutes left for, I'm so sorry for going on for so long, but I leave you with one final question, which my girlfriend yelled at me for asking her at like 3 a.m. last night. So are Hamilton fans Becky Jo? You tell me. All right, so time for the Q&A. And if you have any more questions, you want to see my sources, have any thoughts, then please check out my Twitter at Cartfish with two E's, and we will have five minutes for a very short Q&A now. Thank you so much for coming and watching and listening. And it was great getting to talk to you about all this stuff that I love. Thank you very much. Yes, send your questions now. Carp Sensei, who do you ship Hasebe with? Uh, the, the, easy, the easy answer is everyone. Um, 
but the main answer is Nihongo, who is um, put very simply, he was a guy with the he was a guy with chest hair that has to be able to sleep that tofu drew his him sleeping on. He is uh, the best beer in Japan. He is my personal favorite Delf. He is amazing. Um, What's your favorite historical anime? I have a very big soft spot for Sengoku Basada, but my favorite has to be Meow Meow Japanese History. It is fantastic. Meow Meow Japanese History is my favorite. Is there a way to play Sword Boys in Eagle? No, I'm so sorry. It is actually region locked. You have to VPN to play Token Rambu, but the Wikipedia is the Token Rambu Wiki, God bless the people running it, has very, very comprehensive, very, very well formatted guides to everything. I would highly recommend checking it out. They have stuff about the lines, the lore, everything. Da, da, da. Let me see any other questions. Any other questions? Is there a separate term for women who are into history, but for female characters in history? No, I do not believe so. I think that would go under the Rekijo umbrella. Umbrella. It's just that it's less common, unfortunately. But I definitely hope to see more. And I think that I think that we're going to see a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff of like enthusiasm for Gracia Nanami Hiroki because because. Takarazuka, man. Takarazuka. Is there any overlap with fans of famous Go players, figures, or actors? I'm actually not that clear on famous Go players, figures, and actors, so I can't quite say. I'm very sorry. Uh, da -da. Do you see Reki Joe in other countries except Japan? Well, Reki Joe who are in to Japanese history? Yes, I am one. I am. I know a lot of them, but lots of my friends are. Um, but for Reki Joe who are fans of their own history, I know that there's there's definitely that kind of movement for, especially for like Three Kingdom stuff in China, um, USA, I would say Hamilton. Um, but yes, I think that this can be applied, even though it's not as closely studied or like as, as concentrated as a phenomenon. Have I ever seen Bakumatsu rock? Yes, yes. Commodore Perry, yes. Did Bungo Stray Dogs make me into a Reki Joe? Probably yes. Um, Bungo Stray Dogs is interesting. Um, I Another field of my interest is Taisho authors, actually. Very fun fact. And I think that the way that Taisho authors are treated by fans as a result of properties like BSD and Mungoto Alchemist is actually, is actually, uh, is actually very Reki Joe like to put simply. Oh, yay. I'm very glad to hear that people are reading stuff because of that people are reading stuff because of Google Stray Dogs. I love that. Do you think Jackie Joe culture inadvertently rewrites history in less objective ways lenses because of how ardently and perhaps emotionally personally they inter interpret the history? Does the Dekishi Mamoru also mean Dekishi reinterpretation in a way? Yes. It real it keeps me up at night. It keeps me up at night thinking about how how our perceptions of these characters really affects and and imposes a bias on how they're going to be, on how they're going to be interpreted in the future. Because no one, for example, with Shinsengumi, no one is really ready to have the conversation that like, okay, but these guys were like an authoritarian murder squad. They like, they their whole thing was they were like murdering political dissidents, and the and not not to, like it's just very interesting to see how that narrative has evolved now and how it will probably continue to evolve in the future. Fates and Natalia, Natalia is, it's a bit different, but Fates definitely applies. Um, Sakamoto Ryoma, the picture I used was from Fates. And I just think that, I just think that we are going to have a very interesting time in historical, in historical preservation and record if it means that everything is kind of, if it means that everything is kind of, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, a lot, filtered through this kind of idol stand, we love this person, we love this person lens. I don't know. I have a lot of thoughts on this. I, 
I'm not very coherent on this right now, but I am happy to talk more about it if you at me on Twitter about it. So I don't know, it's my, yep, that is time. I'm sorry, I saw the last question about queerness. I think that's really cool. Please message me on Twitter. And I'm very, very glad to see you all. And thank you so much for listening. Oh, thank you for all the familiar faces. Thank you for everyone, for everyone new. And it was just so great to do this. Thank you so much. And this is Carp signing out. Have a great Shimamuru day.